Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Gaming Materialists. My name is Jean Bagelin, and I am your host for today, uh, talking about all things games. That includes miniatures, roleplay games, but not video games, because we're boomers and we don't touch the, the computers. Well, we do, but we're not going to touch that with a barge pole. Well, uh, today we have a fantastic, interesting uh, show for you today, talking with a veteran of the industry. Uh, but first, I'm going to bring on my co-host. He is the most handsome man in left-wing, Marxist, critic, left-com adjacent and critical theory adjacent podcasting. He is the one, the only. He is the Black Sean King. He is C. Derek Vaughn. Hey, Vaughn, how are you doing? Hey, it's easy to be the most handsome man in a field that consists of, like, two people. Um, hey, who, who are you up against? Who are you up against? Uh, I don't know. I guess, you, I guess actually, if you include Sean from Anti-Father, I'm not the most handsome man. But <laughs> oh, yeah, it's Sean from... Yeah, Sean from Anti-Father, he's a very handsome man. It'd be, it would uh, be Sean, then probably me. And then Doug it, at the bottom. It, 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 um... Yeah. But uh, we're talking about games, not 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 rank most <laughs> most handsome attractive mo most, attractive <laughs> mo most attractive uh, most attractive theory podcaster. Uh, well, you know, I think maybe we need to do that show in the future. Well, uh, everybody, we have a really great guest tonight. He is a veteran of 20 years in the gaming industry uh, managing an uh, independent game store he's my local games master man i suppose i mean what would you call your local uh, the local manager of your local game store what would you call call, call that would do you have the special role for them the master of gamery the prince of games the king of games he is the one the only Carl Morgan, manager of Meta Games. Welcome, Carl, to Gaming Hello. Materialists. How are so, you guys? we're doing good. Uh, we're glad to have you on the show. And uh, yeah, this I've actually been wanting to talk to you for a while about uh, gaming because a lot of the discussions we have about you know games, the games industry, you know, obviously focus on the big companies and the products that people. Are attached to so we've talked about things like games workshop we've talked about dungeons and dragons uh we've talked you know we've talked about a variety of different uh topics but you know on gaming materials one of the things we want to do is actually talk about the uh political economy to use the appropriate marxian terminology of the games industry which of course includes the purveyors of games like yourself you are a manager of a game store and you've been in the industry for a sig significant amount of time. So, you know, that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you. So I kind of wanted to start by asking you, you know, to tell us a little bit about yourself and about how you got into the, uh, got into the games industry and how you became a manager of a store and perhaps go on to talk a little bit about how that has changed perhaps both in material terms and you know how the business functions and also in cultural terms in how people perceive of game stores and uh the paraphernalia of board games and miniature games and role play games oh boy that's a little bit to unpack um so i've been in like i said like you said i've been working here about 20 years if not i think it's a little over 20 years now long time um when I first got in, it was just like, hey, I'm going to work part time at this game store. At the time, I was teaching high school art and working at a college library and working here. Um, eventually, the high school job didn't pan out to like I was working there part time, didn't pan out to what I wanted. Uh, the college library job was was a full time job, but not really what I wanted to do. And then everything fell into place for me to take over working on a regular basis here. <clears throat> um, and then it, you know, it's just sort of blossomed from there as far as work goes. I, before that I, I had uh, worked in various collectible type things. We worked at another store that 
did a little bit of games, mostly comic books and sports cards. I, w- I had come from the music side of things. I actually started, you know, with, with like a record store and they brought me into that store. The, my previous job as, as a uh, guy to sort of take over the music stuff. And then it just sort of, everything sort of morphed and then settled down here. And uh, you you, be, you manage the store, but not only do you manage the store, you run you've run tournaments and and things like that as well. Yeah, I I I've uh, run conventions and tournaments and and that kind of thing, and that's been pretty. It's been a lot of fun. That's probably a lot more stressful than running a game store. And I I was focusing on just doing one big event uh, over the course of a year with a lot of like some feeder events that would that would uh, go into it, but. Uh, we would have like one big, big wrap up tournament um, event at the end of the year. And like at, at the peak was bringing in closer to 600 people. Um, so that was a lot to, lot to manage, but uh, trying to, trying to manage the game store and do that was a lot on my plate. And I got out just in the nick of time, a couple of years before the coronavirus hit. So how would you say, at least in terms of, the, the types of companies you deal with, the types of products you sell. Mm. Have you noticed a change over the last 20 years in terms of taste preferences uh, and also the way that the companies interact with uh, independent stores? Oh, it's, I mean, it's definitely been a huge change from like when I started, it was pretty typical. I mean, we had always here at the store of taking a, trying to be, try to take a note to try to make the store more appealing to just not just the average gamer. We wanted to be like the, the joke is like, you know, if we can make the soccer moms comfortable coming in, you know, we can, you know, make anybody comfortable because gamer, like your prototypical gamers don't care as much, you know, if the store isn't well lit or smells the best or is quite as clean as because that they, they just want to come and play. They'll, they'll endure all that other stuff. But if we can make mom happy when she, you know, drops off her kids, then that, you know, is good for everybody. Um, but it's over the time has changed where it was like your typical gamers and a little bit of mom and dad coming in to now it's like a good mix. Like these, these kids have grown up and are, have families. And I've, I've we've had kids that have started out playing, anywhere from 40k to magic the gathering to dungeons and dragons are now bringing their kids in to learn how to play and so it, it's sort of you know been cultivated through you know p- gamers and now their new families and now it's and because of that it's become much more of a normalized thing in society as opposed to you know the the typical the stereotypical you know like guys in a their mom's basement playing D&D do you ever have any trouble with those guys for, who play, who are, you know, perhaps playing, you know, they perhaps have a perception of what the game store is and that it's their place and they are hostile towards uh, interlopers? Or do you think generally people are pretty open to the expansion of uh, of uh, the base, player base? I think I would say 95% of the people, maybe and probably more than that, are pretty cool with like anybody coming in and playing um really try hard not to be like a gatekeeper of any sort of kind um and try to make sure other people are doing that because you don't want you don't want some somebody who's brand new in any game doesn't matter their background at all coming in and and being like well that was fun but these guys were being dicks to me so i'm not going to come back right well Hmm. Um, have we noticed a, a, a significant gender or age shift? I mean, one of the things that I re- that I have read, but I haven't confirmed, I've just read it anecdotally, that, you know, gaming, the gaming industry 40 years ago was mostly like teenage boys. The gaming year, industry 20 years ago um, was probably people in their 30s and 40s, and the gaming industry now is all over the place. Um, is that reflected in your customer base? Yeah, I would say that's pretty, pretty spot on. Um, 
when when I first started, it was your typical high school to college age males. Um, and as it as time went on, and that's probably a lot to do with you know board games becoming a little more prevalent. Where you know, like if you look at our percentage of what we would sell, you know, back in the day, it was you know a lot of Magic the Gathering, um, a lot of role playing games, decent amount of miniature games, and a little bit of board games. And now it's still a good chunk of magic the gathering but board games are becoming a much bigger percentage of that and because of that and because board games aren't i mean aren't really focused on you know one gender or anything you you see a large female populace playing that and also like to be honest like dungeons and dragons with fifth edition you know whether you're a fan of it or not has brought more people into the back into the hobby than anything and when you've got you know like shows like stranger things on tv and everything is just normalizing it so we we i'm seeing more women running games now than i ever have and and people playing and it's it's pretty well-rounded groups and it's not just hey i'm gonna go hang out with the guys this weekend and play D &D." it's it's people are getting together with their girlfriends and or wives and it's well mixed groups of people playing and not just it's not just you know like the creepy dudes in the basement mm. i have uh i've thought a lot about that what do you think fifth ed really did differently i mean because four fed was such a was such a flop um, yeah <laughs> i'm a i'm a, actually a big fan of fourth edition <laughs> i'm one of the few <laughs> um fifth edition did they were smart on how they, I think how they approached it. They went to the players and said, Hey, we want to make an addition and we want everybody's input. And they try, they took like seemingly took the best of all, all the different editions. They took, you know, sort of like the storytelling emphasis of like second edition, the core rules of third, and then like more of the balance of fourth edition. And they jammed it all together and made it an easier to learn product. And I think, I mean, they just seemed to hit the right notes where it was, it's a game that isn't as daunting to learn how to play as like third edition was so math heavy at times that some people would just get lost or you would play with people who would take advantage of the system and just try to min max everything and made it not fun to play. And, you know, fourth edition, you know, had definitely had its issues. But with fifth, it just it was the right place at the right time, sort of a lightning in a bottle thing. Just with the, I think with the maturing of that that crowd of people that played and now having families and just happened to hit with a system that it was like, oh, I can teach my kids how to play this. Right. And it's not something you have to like take a college course into learning. One of the things about fifth edition, and then I'll, I'll drop the fifth edition questions, but there, it is interesting how much of its supplements are based off of like deep nostalgia, like because there's so many of the supplements that you have to that are like referencing things all the way back to the 70s and 80s. Um, but that hasn't seemed to alienate new players at all, um, which is kind of a gift. Um, maybe it's also the incorporation of magic, the gathering, its formal settings, and wizard actually combining its ip or or whatever but it it does seem to be it, it it's interesting how much nerd shit there is in fifth edition and yet how it doesn't seem to suffer in the same ways that previous attempts to do that have suffered yeah i've i've like i i still am amazed like when you've got like we, we've had like some kid and i and i'm a harder i'm a it's harder for me to judge ages but they looked like they were in high school, like high school or early college a group of kids came in and they were a mix of, you know, like guys and girls coming in, buying D and D books and just listening to them, how much they know. And I think it's one of those rabbit hole things. They get invested in it and, and they start hunting out, you know, like lore and you'll hear them talking about like, um, it is the same thing with games workshop. You'll have, people that get go down these rabbit holes of YouTube videos and it's just mm -hmm. like YouTube videos based on the lore of it. And they get super interested and tied into it because of that. And then they want to play and they want to do, you know, 
more than just watch a YouTube video. That's a really interesting you... point. Oh, go ahead, Vaughn. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying the the observation about the YouTube videos I think is really interesting. I mean, obviously with Dungeons and Dragons, things like Geek and Sundry and obviously Critical Role were extremely important in pe giving people a vision of what a game would look like and also making it like not look nerdy. You have like beautiful people with excellent acting skills doing it. And it's if you enjoy that kind of thing, that's uh, you know that's something that can appeal to everything, but everybody. But I think you, I think what you raise about the law of it, law videos are, is extremely important because this proliferation of YouTube content creation has been like a huge free marketing for Dungeons and Dragons, for Games Workshop, for anything which has some kind of sort of historical law that you can uh, that you can dig up and make a YouTube video on, and it's like a it's like very it's a really remarkable thing. It's it's weird as I get older, you know, people are people are talking about, you know, that box, the first box set of Warhammer Fantasy Battles, the one with the elves and the goblins, as if it's some kind of ancient mythical artifact <laughs> when it was like, oh, I got that for Christmas one year. But suddenly all these things have like an interesting cachet and there's this huge free publicity that gets people into kind of an ecosystem. And of course, as we know, how YouTube what works, you watch one law video, and the next thing you know, all your uh, all your YouTube recommendations are like uh, that dude who, what's his name, Jordan with a P, who does yeah, Jordan uh, with a PH and like uh, nerd foundry nerd, and nerd, yeah. yeah, like is you, it, you, you, you can tell I've actually done this, <laughs> I've gone down this rabbit hole. How um, did how how did the player base take the uh, combination though of uh, um the um magic the gathering which i mean maybe i'm wrong but i i would assume magic the gathering is probably a, one of the biggest proportions of your sales as it's such a like popular yeah. game uh how did they take like the combination with dnd &D? was it was it magic the gather play, gathering players who p happened to play dnd &D who played it or did, did it spread the appeal of like magic the gathering did the did those two things synergize you as know wizards I... I don't I don't know how much like you definitely had so magic right now is in a very weird spot where it's a it's a much more casual game than it used to be like five six years ago it was very tournament oriented and now mm -hmm. it's very casual play is king and this you know they've got a variant called commander that you know drives a format when they you know, and, and I'd even heard in the industry, I don't know how many years ago at a trade show, it's like Wizards of the Coast didn't want to ever mix the two because they just thought they were cannibalizing their own their own clientele by, you know, if like, oh, if we did a magic D&D &D supplement, it would be bad for D&D &D and vice versa. And now, you know, in this last year, we've had that. We've had magic supplements for D&D. &D. They're fine. And you've got D and D in Magic: The Gathering now too. They did a whole set that was a Forgotten Realm set, so hmm. and that was super popular. But it 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 I think it helped Magic more than it helped D and D because the D and D players are going to buy no matter you know what they have, no matter what it is, because it's just more content for them. And they you know if you're running your own game, as an example, Strixhaven is the last book, and that's their for lack of a better term, they're Hogwarts. You know, mm -hmm. it's a magical school thing. The D and D players, the hardcore players, don't care if it's Strixhaven or whatever. They can rename it, they can reskin it to whatever they want and use that material. But you know, it, it is what it is. It's the they did a a Theros book that was very sort of a Greek god oriented mm -hmm. thing. That's a Magic the Gathering setting. The D and D players love that because it's just more gods that they can use and at work in their game. So it's not a, to them. It's it's just another book to use, where you get a few Magic players coming over, going, "Oh, this is interesting." The the D and D players are just like, "Hey, it's another book. That's cool." But it, it's I think when you look at the two games, Magic was helped more by bringing in more casual people with the Forgotten Realm set than vice versa. Right.
So one thing I've wondered about this, uh, there there has been these cycles of basically the, the, the RPG world goes in cycles around the success or failure of D&D at any given time. Like White Wolf, for example, coming up does seem to be somewhat directly related to the decline of TSR. Um, uh, but since 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 the open license and since D D fifth edition has still kind of maintained that attitude, has D D brought other games up or or has it suppressed them in sales? Um you know Um I think you're like when it comes to role playing games, now that you know, you get this whole group of people that have gotten into role playing through fifth edition and we're now starting to see them opening up to other types of games because they realize that like DD is great, but there's other stuff out there. So like, I think in the last four, six months, we're starting to see a bigger increase in like the call of Cthulhu books. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the Dune role-playing game, it's sitting on the shelf and, you know, we had a couple come in tonight and they were just like, Oh, Hey, look, it's a Dune role-playing game. And they, they, they know what a role-playing game is and they know what Dune is. They put the two and two together and they, are more interested now so it's not like there's there's more open to trying out that kind of stuff and it in people now the a uh, huge difference now compared to like you know 10 years ago you would have people like oh i just want to play third edition D D, and they it was more about the mechanics mm-hmm. and now it's just like oh they they're looking for a cool role-playing game and they don't care as much about the mechanics and I think that anybody that plays a lot of role-playing games or like that, they you find a good group, but it doesn't matter what game you play. The game's going to be fun if you got a good group. How's the, how's Pathfinder navigating this uh, transformation? Since Pathfinder briefly eclipsed Dungeons & Dragons during 4th edition era and became kind of pe- people's favorite game, it se- Pathfinder seems to be in decline or would that be an unfair assessment? Do people still um, definitely in a decline as far as sales go? Mm-hmm. I mean, at least on our end now and that uh, it's so when, when the split happened with third and fourth edition and Pathfinder and a lot of people went to Pathfinder because they were, they knew what third edition D and D was all about and it was just more of the same and they didn't really have to relearn anything. And you had a lot of the old school players who were just like, I'm never going to play fourth edition. They didn't care, you know, what it did, what it looked like. They were just not going to do it. And it's because, I mean, a lot of people invested a ton of money. And, and when you talk about third edition um, sales and all the sales from all the different books, the, the amount of material that was published for third edition was mind boggling. Every week there would be book upon like, 20, 30 books that you could get that were brand new. Now, quality on them was all over the map too. Like you would have some that were fantastic, but the majority of them were garbage. And you would, you know, your GMs would have to do a lot of work to to vet the books to make sure it was something they could use or not. Um, and with fourth edition, you didn't have that. But when, when Pathfinder sort of took up the reins of third, a lot of people just said, hey, you know, instead of just being honest and saying, Hey, I've already knows this game and I want to keep playing it. And they, there was this weird backlash from fourth and a lot of people that hate fourth edition, I would say had never even played it. Um, but it is what it is. Fourth edition went on. It still sold well for us. Um, but Pathfinder was very popular and kept, it sort of kept that ball rolling. And then, um, but now, Pathfinder with second edition is seeing a lot of the same backlash as like D and D fourth edition had. You had people who are just like, no, nah, I don't, I don't really care for it. Or and you got some that are like playing it and it's fine. And it's just, it's really like, what do you have and what are you comfortable with? Because like, as long as you got like a core book for most games, you don't need to buy other stuff. Just because it's out of print, as long as you got it, you're fine. You can keep playing it. Nobody says you have to stop if a new edition comes out, but it right. is. I, I do think it's funny watching Pathfinder players now giving me the same answer that you know they did about D and D when Fourth Edition came out. Like, oh, I'm not going to pay play Second Edition. I've got First. So, yeah. Um, 
it's interesting with Pathfinder because the other thing is that it's second edition has does actually make changes. It does substantially deviate it from 3.5 um, in ways that first edition Pathfinder didn't. Also, Pathfinder was also material like th- the amount of material they put out for their first round was obscene. Like oh, there's tons. Yeah, uh, they seem to have also learned not to overproduce. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, although. It, it, it definitely yeah. seems that uh, that uh, Wizards of the Coast are more sparing with their book releases. Yes, I mean, and it's it's an easier cycle to manage. I mean, how is do I mean how do like I mean compared to compared to previous compared to, to third edition, it seems like maybe you get or, a couple of books even. You get yeah, a couple third, of books a year, maybe. With third and fourth, you would get like like official books like for fourth edition it was almost like two books a month yeah. one or two books a month and with third edition it was like official you would get at least one a month but they would also make a lot more of these thinner splat books um, right and you would get a lot of those um and and now it's definitely like one a quarter is about mm-hmm. what it seems like and that seems to be a, they, they found sort of that that nice even like number to put out. And when you're asking somebody to dump $50 on a book, cause all they make are hardback books, right? You know, you can't, you can't just flood the market with that. Like yeah. people can't afford to buy that all the time. It, it is interesting that they include though, like with the setting books are thinner than they used to be. Um, uh, and more open and uh, for, for Wizards of the Coast. But a whole lot of the rules are, are in adventure books now, which was not the case prior. So that's an interesting change. Yeah, I think they're trying um, to make it to where everybody feels comfortable buying everything. It's. Right? I mean, I think it's a smart a smart strategy. If you already see, what, four or five books a year, you can say, hey, why don't you buy the four or five books a year? Whereas if you're selling, what, two mo- books a month, no one could keep up with that. And to pivot on that, you know, that is to a certain degree the problem that Games Workshop is having with their hectic schedule release. But I I want to dial back that question back a little bit and ask. So we talked about uh, role play games and, you know, the changing demographic of role play games. Uh, Would you say there's a parallel development in miniature games uh, or or at least in miniature collecting? Um, no. No. Um, board games, definitely there's, you know, you, you, the audience is very open. It's a good mix. Miniature games are one of the things that you still see primarily male driven market. And like, so I was a big fan of the game war machine, which is put out by privateer press. That's what I ran my convention on. Um, it was nice because when they came out, one of the things they did is they had, a good mix of male and female protagonist. Um, the models were not, you know, like it's not all, you know, dudes at war. It's, it looked like, or, or, or it's not all boob plate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a good amount of that still, but it was, it was a little more toned down, but what we found is with war machine, there was an actual, there was a small, but definitely larger female audience than there was for 40k or fantasy and i think that was because they you know it, it's it's the whole idea that representation matters and if you are represented you're going to be more comfortable you know checking out a game and and when you know you have a guy showing his girlfriend like hey we've got all these models and and this game had like 40k or fantasy is primarily male unless you get the the female model army <laughs> or the right. female army and and then in war machine it's mixed in where they where the some of the more stronger characters in there it's a mix of male and female and there's not like one that's dominant over the other it's a pretty strong mix and with that game you actually saw a good group of players whereas you see a few women play games workshop stuff but it's not a it's not enough to where i feel like it's made a noticeable difference even with but a game like age of sigma where they seem to be definitely trying to make it make it more representative helped, and there are there are more um but it it still feels like there's it's not not as noticeable 
So you would say the kind of changes that have affected the role play game market and the kind of people involved, there's been a little bit of that in the miniature industry, uh, in the miniature market, but nowhere near the same degree. Correct. Correct. And would would you say that the the problem is less the product and more the community, or because you, you know, know if War Machine, if War Machine is doing you know, like uh, representative models, the question then is like, why is this not, you know, doing having the same result? I mean, Games Workshop is, also seems to be trying to move in that direction. But uh, so is it, so, so would you say it's the community? And if so, why? I think, so I would equate it to, if we look how role-playing was um, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, where it was a primarily male driven, there were still females that played it, but it was primarily male driven market. And then as it became more normalized and people grew up with it and are introducing their family to it. Now, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take another generation. It may be of, to get to where it's like, it's more normalized. I think it's a long, I mean, it's a long process and it's probably not the most comfortable game for, for people to like, and, and I'm going to use 40k just because it's the the biggest game out there. Uh, but if you go, if you were to go to, you know, an event for that, it's you know very very testosterone heavy, and it's it would probably not be the most comfortable for some women, and they would stick out so like a sore thumb, and like so, and some women are cool with it and handle it really well, and others it can make comfortable uncomfortable and in until they get past that part, it's going to be tough to tough to make it a noticeable change. And but I think it's I think it's happening as more of these people are you know like growing up and having families and realizing it's more than just a boys club. And if if they're and I think that's why you see like these companies trying to pivot and change and be more responsive to that. And some companies do it better than others, just the way it works. So are you telling are you telling us, Carl, that? That these companies, it, rather than following uh, George Soros's woke liberal <laughs> agenda designed to turn us all into cucks, are responding to market forces? Is that would that would that be an accurate? I mean, that it happens. It's just yeah. uh, it happens. I don't know what to say. It's. I mean, because this is one of the things I find very interesting about the discourse. It's very much thrown into the culture war when, in fact, like there's a perfectly like explainable market uh explanation for for these transformations when you see you... somebody like games workshop making like the the hey if you're if, you know if you are if you don't like this that or the other and it's basically like yeah we're trying to be inclusive and make everybody feel welcome and if you don't like that we don't want you and then you get a portion of their audience who gets mad about that and it's like it's like no it's like I would rather sell to everybody than than a small section. <laughs> that's just yeah, that's just basic yeah. capitalism. <laughs> Nerds who grew up in the '80s and '90s are are uh, um, are probably a declining demographic over time. You know, just saying. Um, true. So, um, true. so I mean, one of the things though that I that I've thought about when we talk about this, and we talked a lot about specific games, but the gaming practices are are interesting one rpgs kind of have followed the publishing industry and its model and that has having worked in it i know all kinds of problems that are unique to <laughs> publishing including a bunch of weird deals that were made to keep publishing viable and like world war ii that we still go by for some weird reason um uh, for those of you who don't know like what happens to remainder books well they just get pulped like um at but uh, has Kickstarter and, and we know Amazon's affected everybody's business, but oh, particularly yeah. because of the, the the way they force up at like almost wholesale discounts upon everyone. But um, but and that of course favors people like Wizards um, uh, because Wizards can can afford to offer deep discounts on Amazon, <laughs> uh, even at the cost of their you know. Their primary uh, small store distribution. As a as a note to that, it is often like we can often 
if we wanted to, we could buy our like D and D players handbooks cheaper on Amazon than we can order it from our wholesalers. Ooh. And those are sold by wizards of the coast. That's it's one of our, one of our big issues with them. And they just, they just turn a blind eye. They don't care. They see that as probably like a loss leader for them. It's like, if they can sell, you know, get get it in the hands of more people, that means more people are playing. But well, because if you're a company and you're not on Amazon, you're going to have your market share gazumped, right? Because I mean, people it, will just people will just buy things uh, on Amazon. It, it really depends on scale, though, because like a sm- like small indie games probably don't benefit from Amazon at all. They, um, I notice I mean, they tend not to use them. Um, yeah, like you, you've got, you've got some companies that will, you have companies, even like some bigger companies that, um, have their map policy, which is their minimum advertised price, where it's like, you can sell this, but you can't sell it more than 20% off. And that includes Amazon and, and sometimes Amazon stays on it and sometimes they don't. And it, it's just something you'll, you'll, in our like various groups online, like Facebook retailer groups you'll see people complain about that probably more than anything else like oh this person's breaking the map policy <laughs> and and they're deep discounting games where they shouldn't be but to a certain degree uh Carl, would you say uh the game shop is insulated a bit from amazon when compared to other shops because your the activities taking place that aren't just uh purchasing products but also the gaming takes place there. yeah and that's like i've always been a big proponent of like we build communities first and sell games after that because it makes it much easier to fight online stuff it's like if i if i'm if i've built a community of players and i want them to go oh i want to go buy it from carl instead of thinking of like it's like i could buy this on amazon but i want to go see carl and i want to buy it there and if i can get people to think that then that you know i've won half my battle there just trying to get them to you know walk in the store just to chat and if and then if i they're comfortable here then they're you know they're gonna you know eat the extra cost it is to buy from us then they'll save by going to amazon and not have anybody to interact with and and not only that they won't have anyone to play with either exactly you've got you've got a built-in community of players here and no matter if it's board games or or card games or whatever so like it seems like you know amazon isn't much like as far as card games go we don't see much of that being driven by amazon you do have a lot of role players that and but the board game market is where amazon hurts the most Hmm. well before we get on to uh board games i do want to ask one thing there's been a lot of chitter chatter on the internet about Games Workshop having peaked and and now their business, their shady business practices and exploitative business practices are kind of coming back to hurt them in the ass. Are you seeing any of that? Is there Games Workshop fatigue? Are people, or, or is things are things as ha- at least at least uh, in your shop are things as hectic the, as ever? We're still selling stuff just fine. Um, I know that there's. <laughs> It's, I always call, you know, people who complain about Games Workshop, it's like battered wives syndrome. It's they'll complain, they'll complain, and complain, but oh, I still love them. And they'll still, you know, people will still, you know, shell out the money to buy their stuff. Carl, um, don't let me buy Games Workshop products. Yeah? <laughs> don't, don't let me do it. Don't let me come crawling back to GW. I'm, I've, I've left her for Mantic and it's, it's, a, it's over. But, I mean, it's been that it's not, this isn't anything new. This is just Mm -hmm. like maybe on a larger scale, but it's nothing new. We've seen this. I don't know how many times of like you people complain about their price hikes or complain about one thing or another, but then it, it evens out. So, I mean, I like when we started, when I started doing more of the ordering and when I was working here, when I started working here, our biggest, uh, um, competition for games workshop was games workshop themselves and they've i think realized that they have to work a little bit with us although there's i think now we're seeing a new era of them trying to compete in different ways by by shorting stores product so they can try to sell more of it on their online store instead of just 
them going, hey, we're going to have this awesome sale that nobody else has access to like right. they used to back in the day. Um, but Basically, artificial scarcity in shops. Yes. yes. Mm. I think that's a that's our biggest issue. But and, the, and they've got a really nice veil to sort of hide that behind right now with the shipping issues that right. a lot of places are having. So you don't and, w- and because they don't are there's no transparency in knowing what's actually going on. It's pretty it's pretty hard to call them out like, oh, you're actually out of this or no, you're just, you know, shorting everybody so you can sell more of it online. And are there any companies that are even making a dent or at least becoming more popular uh, 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 to Games Workshop? I mean, because when I was growing up, Games Workshop was really the only miniature game in town, but it seems like there's more, there are more options today, but how are they doing vis-a-vis GMG? It's, it's very niche. So like, but Games Workshop is still what probably what ninety percent of the miniature game market. Right. Um, it, when you're talking about actual games, now if you talk about just miniatures, then you have other things. But you know now with like like Fantasy Flight, Asmodee has Star Wars Legion, X Wing, the Marvel superhero game. Those have a lot of fans, but it's still. I mean, we sell a lot of that. But it's still like a fraction of what Games Workshop sells. And how is so, 3D printers? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Vaughn. Sorry. I was just going to ask you: Are, are Asmo Days, uh, uh, Flight Asmo Days business practices uh, significantly better than Games Workshops? Um, business practice. I mean, <clears throat> they they did have like their, they had a map policy. They have a map policy where you can't advertise any products more than 20%, which I think is good, but they will suspend that map policy anytime that they know that as uh, Amazon's running a sale. So <laughs> they can, Amazon can do whatever they want during like, okay. And they'll let us suspend it. But it's like, if we, if we sold games that cheap, we're you know going to go out of business. So it's not like we're going to do that. Um, so that uh, that is like a minor quibble, I guess. But I mean, they they're right now. I think my only complaint about Asthma Day is is they've uh, bought out one of the bigger online stores, and so we're trying to figure out how that's going to affect our business. And if if they go into a Games Workshop mode where it's they're funneling product to that online store as opposed to the stores around the country like ours. You know how's that going to affect games overall? Can you talk a little bit more about that purchase? Uh, who's involved in, uh, and and what exactly Asmodee produce and why they're such a big player in the market? So Asmodee um, is, I believe, a was a French board game company who were bought out by and and I may be getting part of this wrong, and I apologize if I am. But they got bought out by a corporation um that was using i mean it's like any other big big business that you know has subsidiaries of various kinds they bought out that corporation as another you know feather in their hat and then when they when they would sell then they would break it off and sell it to whoever and try to make money on it it's like you know like a glorified stock for them but they put enough money into it where they started going around snatching up a ton of smaller publishers and now Asmodee went from being a very small niche company to um, controlling a, a huge percentage of the board game market. They, what board games would you say people would know if you're, you know, a, a board I game mean, player? They so Settlers of Catan is like the number one, right? Mm-hmm. That game has been out forever. Uh, that that was a staple of Mayfair games for years and years. And Mayfair and normies it. play that game. Normies yeah. play. Oh that yeah, game. no, it's a it's in most board games anymore. I would say, you know, what you would call a normie is just a typical family, and the more and more of those people are playing board games like it's a no big deal, and they're out hunting for these better games like that. And Catan sort of started that whole trend. Um, but Catan was, I mean, was Mayfair Games' number one selling game by far. And they they sold it to Asmodee, and they bought the whole Catan license from them, and and the the name and games, the whole nine yards. Um, 
And then they bought out, you know, they bought out Fantasy Flight, which was a huge board game maker in the U.S. anyway, and had all kinds of different games. And I mean, they just and they would just snatch up little ones here and there. Now, I would say it's an easy fifty percent, you know, of the market of of like top selling board games. So if you if you're gonna if you are a game store, you have to deal with them. Mm. And they've been they've been. You go ahead, Val. Uh, do we see this tendency towards monopolization across the industry? I mean, we kind of seen it with uh, even with. I mean, there are countervailing tendencies in, in, like, say, indie games where, you know, between drive through RPG and Kickstarters, there's a lot of them. But um, I'm thinking of Asmodee, I'm thinking of Wizards, but I'm also thinking of just how many of these, uh, like, Free Liga and uh, Mordifius Games as far as distribution, you know, just buying up. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the case of Modifius, uh buying a distribution rights to all kinds of foreign games, be they mm-hmm. Swedish or not. Um, are we seeing this ten- this tendency towards monopolization across the industry? Um, I mean, it's that kind of thing. I get. I think in the gaming industry, it's more of a distribution model than mm-hmm. a monopolization model. Okay. Where they're not trying to. Most of those come like Modifius isn't. I. They're not trying to corner the you know, market on role-playing games, but they are providing a service to a lot of, a lot of people who may not get their stuff, you know, released in the U S as easy. Um, uh, and we're now able to get that, like, you know, the stuff that we normally wouldn't be able to get. It was it, the board game market was a lot, very similar where like you would have somebody like Mayfair or Rio Grande back in the day would, would buy the rights to do a board game from, random German designer and they would say, Hey, we're going to publish it in the U S for you. And they would do the U S publication rights and they would produce it for so long. And then they would re up the deal or they wouldn't. And, and, but it was a way for stuff to get released in the U S that normally wouldn't see the light of day. Mm. And I think you're seeing a lot of that with, with stuff like Modifius. Um, but it, it, Asmodee feels different where it's like, they have the the capital and the ability to go around and buy up companies left and right. And it feels like, I don't, I, I hate to use the term oppressive, but it's definitely like, it's noticeable. And they're snowballing, right? They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Seems and now, like which, uh, which was the, did they buy uh, miniature Mart? Was it that they bought miniature? They bought miniature market, which is one of the, one of the bigger online game stores. And I guess the information about that didn't come out until after what Asmodee sold to um, a video game company, a big corporation that owned them. And in the stockholders meeting, it came out that they had bought in miniature market and nobody knew about it. And then it, and then everybody was like, Whoa, hold up. So that's why like a lot of, a lot of people's like antennas went up when that happened. So um, we can keep an eye on it and make sure like you know, if miniature market all of a sudden has access to a lot of games that we don't, and we're theoretically going through the same distribution channels, you know, there's going to be an issue there. I think. Right, because a lot of these people are trying to get in on the uh, on, on the increased popularity of nerd culture, and controlling distribution is obviously a good uh, money maker. So I guess like the last question I kind of want to ask, unless there's something you want to add about Asmodee, is uh, is about the pandemic and how that's affected uh, uh, the game store and you know uh, what has it driven new people. So how would you how have, how have you guys been faring? Because retail has been taken to uh, the cleaners by the pandemic. It's been disastrous for uh, uh, walk-in stores, but you know I I, I would assume. The di- your dynamic is slightly different, so are yeah, very different. <clears throat> um, the pandemic has actually helped us out a ton, and as weird as that sounds, especially from a, a business model where we do a lot of events here at the store, and like our events are sort of like our primary advertising because we don't typically do TV or radio ads. Mm-hmm. Um, but when people were starting to look for things to do with their families because they're stuck in the house with them. 
they've reverted to role-playing games and board games and miniature games and people who used to play like we had people who played miniature games for a long time have come back and they're like oh well i'm stuck in the house so i'm gonna buy a bunch of models and actually sit down and paint them and then i'll play when i get to play or you just have families that'll come in and buy you know board games board games were, have been a huge seller throughout the last couple of years i mean it's so they've already were doing well but then it just sort of put them into overdrive um and and same thing with role playing games. It was amazing. I thought for sure people would get sick of playing role playing games, uh, you know, on <laughs> online. But there's still tons of people who are just now playing with their families. And on top of you know you know systems like Roll Twenty and and mm-hmm. other online platforms where you can hop on and play and get your get your games in in safety. So, but yeah, we. I can't complain because we've actually had a great year. Well, oh, good. Somebody's uh, somebody at least is. Do- Maybe <laughs> it's a pandemic planned by the role play game industry. No, there we go. Yeah. There's <laughs> a new be- theory. There's a th- new theory to to put out there uh, right now. Vaughn? Big mask Questions? and wizards, I guess. No, I, I I have been wondering about that, particularly with like Roll Twenty and uh, Fantasy Grounds and. And all that just seeming seeming to grow like exponentially. I've noticed more and more like even on Kickstarters, if you if you're serious, you know, um, if you're not doing something super niche, you have to now produce the stuff for Fantasy Grounds and Roll Twenty. Um, so, uh, do you think that's going to remain after the? Because I think it might actually. I think this may have become like a a, a perma fixture. Yeah, um, I. I mean, I'd like to say, sure. I mean, Not <laughs> ideally, <laughs> ideally it remains. Um, but it's the idea that people, it's these are new learned habits that people are, you know, getting into. They are, you know, like trying out these new hobbies. And some of them will stick. Some of them will keep playing Magic. And some of them will keep playing 40K. And some of them will drop out. But stuff that you can do with everybody, like board games, are going to are gonna stick. And, and the more people realize that there's more to play than just monopoly in life and uno they're going to be looking for better stuff and that's where we've got i think our you know like in the future it's more you know, i think we were sort of hitting on it earlier with like kickstarter stuff but kickstarter is going to be like to me is our our one of our big competitors in the future and it's like and even right now we try to like figure out like what is going on Kickstarter that we can just ignore because they've already sold to their whole uh, clientele and what stuff is actually going to translate to bigger audiences. And that's tough to do. Hmm. Yeah. I I was wondering about, except for something that like funds itself in five minutes. um, It it does seem like that's a a pretty big risk on uh, the part of game shops and whatnot. Um, particularly, I mean, I, I have seen again, I follow Kickstarter, I, the kicks, I, I support a lot of stuff. It, it, I've, I've noticed a shift in the last three years to being more supportive of stores and, and, yes, and, and, uh, in the Kickstarting packages, but it still seems like as a store, how do you know? Like, because right. unless it's immediate, funded, you don't know what's going to catch and what isn't, and how, yeah. how you, anyone really has either. Have you, know. you uh, ha- has, uh, have you gone in as a shop to any Kickstarters? Are there any Kickstarters you jumped in on? Um, we try to only back with companies that we know are going to follow through and we're not going to have to worry about not getting it. And then we also make sure that they've got a decent retailer program set up. So um, Cool Mini or Not, which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they, they do some like – silly stuff from here here and there but they actually have a pretty good retailer program set up to where we can go in and get all the stuff that's in a kickstarter but unlike like the general public who have to like pony up the entire amount when the kickstarter is finished we put down like a small deposit and then we don't have to pay until right before it ships so and they uh, cool mini or not has some very cool games i played the uh the valhalla game I, I can't remember. Oh, blood, 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 rage. Some, blood rage. Love that yeah. game. Really good game. Um, actually, that uh, on that point, uh, as a uh, purveyor of uh, board games and miniature mm-hmm. games and role play games, do you have any board games that you could recommend to our viewers that you think are 
new, exciting, and uh, worth checking out. Oh, man. That's one of the things I love about working in a game store is like literally like week to week, it's like Christmas because you get to see all the new stuff coming in throughout the year. Um, trying to think off the top of my head because um, we're, like, we're also in a mode of being out of stock of everything and waiting for restocks to come in. Um, Nemesis, if you can find it, is one of those that's like a pretty big game, but it's a, you know, it's sort of a aliens the board game where you're mm-hmm. trapped on a ship and and you may or may or you you have your own goals and the group has a goal of trying to survive and you're trying to like meet your own goals while surviving the aliens that are running around attacking everybody that one's pretty cool um and that that's going to be one just because of how hard it is to find that when stores get it in they'll turn around and sell it really quick and then you have to wait another six months for a restock um but if you can find that that game's fantastic um there's man uh all kinds of good small games um of various kinds it just sort of depends on really what you know i don't know board games are like i I always say they're like going to a movie like there's a million board games out there and a million different you know uh styles and i may hate one style and you may love it it's like it's like hey if we go to a movie you know, you may like romantic comedies and I don't, and, or you may like horror and, you know, and I don't, and it's just a matter of finding what you like. There's certain types that I don't like, but I know are still good games. And, and that's going to always, you know, she, she, she likes cops and he uh, likes Euro games. Yeah. Final yeah. question, Vaughn, before we uh, end the show. Um, Anything you want to ask before we uh, wrap up? I suppose I just ask if if uh, you had a prediction about what may be changing in the gaming industry in the next two to three years, what would that prediction be? Um, I think I think you're going to see. Well, I think you've seen companies like Wizards of the Coast with some of their games, like Magic the Gathering and D and D, make a big push for more inclusivity with like getting different types of people to play i think you're going to definitely still see that from the miniature games um and i but i think it's just going to be more the same for the next few years the big thing is going to be how how like are probably things that the normal people aren't going to see it's going to be how games are sold right now there's a big i say big there's a backlash uh with kickstarter with some smaller publishers because Kickstarter came out and said that they were going to support um, uh, blockchain stuff, and and that I don't even claim to know everything about that. I, I I'm too busy <laughs> to, to look into crypto, and I don't have the money to throw into it. And um, but I don't understand it. So, but I know that it, it's irritated a lot of publishers. I think you're going to see probably more small publishers go the route of developing their own in-house kickstarter type programs Mm -hmm. where they're going to try they're going to try to just effectively pre-sell stuff themselves um instead of going going through various distribution models or through kickstarter and i mean there's been companies that have done this in the past this isn't anything new hero Uh, quest was hero quest had its own uh when they yeah that release that's through had, hasbro and they're you know giant corporation they're, but. they're giant corp, but, but they <laughs> but they had them they had the resources to do it so they didn't go through kickstarter right yeah, well they they could have made that game on their own they didn't need like kickstarter the original it was kind of bullshit kick- it was kind of bullshit that they did that and that's like the problem with the kickstarter model it's like it's pretty good for small companies and people who wouldn't have the resources sure. to do it but it can be very exploitative if these like big companies just do it in order to like avoid deploying capital for a project they, that they, they don't they, 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 they lose out on so with for the bigger projects these companies that that don't need kickstarter are effectively using it as pre-sale and they lose you know that 15 to 20 percent going through kickstarter as opposed to 50 percent through a normal distribution chain so for right. them it's just a they get a bigger percentage by pre-selling it than than you know and that and I, you understand that, but also eventually the, I would like to think that that will come to a point where it's not going to be as easy to do because with there being 
if you are undercutting game stores like that, it's going to make it harder for them to get their product in front of people. But like the board game people that buy, like the, the board game fans are so ate up with FOMO that if they, they think they're missing out on, you know, one or two card promo pack that is only going to be available on the Kickstarter, they, they'll will, pay it. They'll pay it. And they'll, you know, they'll pay $200 and wait two years for it because they've got something that, you know, they wouldn't have otherwise. And it's in, and, and that's a whole, that's a whole other, a whole other topic that I can get into, but it's a, it's a pretty funny thing to watch when like people like going out of their way to pay a ton extra for board game expansions that they won't play 80% of. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Carl, it, it has been one hour. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, your time with us, sharing your expertise with us. It was actually very, like one of the most interesting interviews we've done for a while uh, that we've done so far because you know it's really interesting to sort of see underneath the hood of uh the gaming industry and what it looks like to be on the front line of nerddom so um yeah so uh everybody make sure to like and subscribe to both Vaughn vlog and to this is revolution uh check out if you ever come through Springfield, Missouri, can you can you tell us about uh, the name of your store, Carl, and yeah, where it is? Metagames Unlimited. Uh, we're right at the intersection of Highway 65 and Sunshine Street, and we would love to see people yeah. come through. You can come visit us on your way to Branson, Missouri. Yeah, when everybody's hitting to go see the Yakov Shmonov uh, comedy special, right? In Soviet Russia, game plays you. But um, yeah, so it's a uh, uh, so yeah, so check out Meta Games if you're coming through Spring Springfield. Like and subscribe to our two channels. Become a patron to Vaughn Vlog or This Is Revolution if you have the means, and if you if you would like to, uh, as we now do, I will put the disclaimer. Please remember, when supporting a podcast, you aren't doing politics. You're supporting the entertainment you enjoy, and uh, and maybe it's educational in the way Sesame Street is educational. So, um, yeah, with that said, thank you again, and we are out.